asked you guys which should I review next, the Torrent Lancol 215, Dark Base 500 DX, CL500, or the Silent Base 802. The votes cast the Lancol 215 as the winner, and here I am to review it. I also asked for suggestions, but nobody had the foresight to tell me. The Fractal Design Torrent Compact and Nano were going to be released less than 24 hours later. To be fair, I didn't know either, so I'll take the hit on this one. Hopefully, this review can make up for my lacking foresight and performance. Speaking of which, how does the Lian Lee Lancol 215 perform in all departments? Let's find out, starting with the unboxing. Nothing special in the packaging department, all the usual, let's move on sharpish. Starting up front, the filter is integrated into the front panel. It's essentially perforated steel, equivalent to a very coarse mesh internal filter. Great for airflow, not so much for dust. To the base is Lee and Lee's logo cut out of an aluminium plate. It's backed by a translucent, translucent sheet that diffuses the ARGB LEDs behind it. Despite the rough appearance of the surface, it's actually completely smooth, uh, like a glossy kind of finish. A real nice touch pun intended. Moving on upwards through the top of the front panel that looks like at some point in its design life might have housed the front I.O., which is actually fixed to the top panel which avoids the need and risk of removing the front panel with the I.O. attached or slotted through. All in all we've got a mic headphone combo jack, a couple of USB 3.0 ports and LED mode button that's separate to the reset button, and a power button that's surrounded by an LED diffuser. Not ARGB, just white for this one. We've also got a top filter that's the typical plastic mesh with magnetic strips. Does the job? Nothing special. Around the back, the layout is very standard for an ATX case. Lower power supply unit position, central PCI Express slots, and upper motherboard I.O. and fan position. Down under is a full-sized filter. I'm really not sure why though, it's not like there's any lower fan support. There are fan positions above the basement shroud, but that's littered with issues we'll get into when we cover the fans later. I guess it could help a little with the drive cooling, but the drive section will likely be exhausting out of the more open top of the basement section, if anything, so seems like a missed opportunity to save some expense without lessening the case's ability. Speaking of expense, there are full-length plastic skirts that act as the rails for the full-length filter and contain the rubber pads that act as feet for the case. Whilst I've stuck my foot into it, the MSRP of this case is, or at least was, $70, which would place this as one of Lian Lee's cheapest cases. It would appear that this is an attempt for Lian Lee to dip their toes more into the mid-range case market, so I may be making some comments regarding to manufacturing and assembly expenses like the oversized base filter that may be unnecessarily too expensive impeding the cost dropping further. It's a nice filter but I think there's no need for it to be that big. Let's move on to the side panels and more importantly removing them to get inside. The steel side panel is plain, no intakes going on here, just a plain steel side panel. It's fixed to the chassis with retained thumb screws, and these are never not awkward. The chance of stripping a thread is increased, and you can't see whether it's lined up nicely with the hole or if it's clashing with the chassis when trying to replace the panel. The front side of the panel isn't much better. They've opted for a couple of winged tabs that interface with the slots in the chassis. They're kind of hit and miss, and I'd much rather prefer a linear slot, which could have easily been formed in instead of the raised return, or in addition to if required. On a couple of occasions there were some minor misalignments going on and I was faffing around with the thumb screws so I didn't notice, and when I thought I was done I soon realised I had to start again. In the end I just resorted to laying the case on its side to replace the panel and considering there were, are plenty of cases around on the market where this is not required, it leads me to believe, or more accurately leads me to claim, this isn't great design. Not to be mean about it, but the acronym KISS comes to mind. Solid panel though. The window side panel thankfully is much better. Removing it is easier, I describe it as gliding off, and I think the weight of that glass really helps with that. It's 4mm thick if you wanted to know. I didn't like the lack of tactile feedback when removing it, and that's pronounced by the lack of a handle or any sort of grip to the rear. There's not a lot to hold onto to control its removal. A simple press in the steel, like most other cases, or the other side panel would have been plenty, just something to allow me to control it being removed and replaced with ease. 
Outside of the whinging, the top is lined with a foam strip, which I guess is there to prevent vibration or just clashing around, and that's a nice touch. And while the returns to the rear covers the fan screws, that's perfectly fine since you won't be accessing the fan screws without having removed the panel first. And finally, the front panel. Back to a downer. As part of the cost reducing techniques employed to bring the cost for the typical Lee and Lee case down, they've opted for the cheapest and simplest form of attaching a front panel. And unfortunately, it also provides the worst user experience. It's not like you'll be doing this often since there's no internal filter to access, but yanking this thing off takes a lot of force. It's also worth pointing out that you should really take care when replacing it since there's a fair chance you could pinch one or some of the fan wires, which would really put the icing on top of the replacing the last panel to complete your build cake. They have cable managed the wires somewhat, but they're still in the line of fire. Now we're in, let's talk fans and radiator support. I didn't actually intend to revamp my compatibility slides for this video and they visually still need some work, but if you want to know what this thing can take, here's the basic rundown. For those not used to them, the radiator and fan graphics used to be represented face on and they had to be split onto two pages, two slides. Now they're side on, they can be put side by side on the same slide, much easier for you guys. Anyway. Front-wise, this thing can take a couple of 200mm fans, which are included with the case, ARGB no less, but we'll cover the ARGB info later on. You can also fit a couple of 140s and a few 120s. Radiators can match the fans up to 280 or, or 360mm. Depth-wise, there's 40mm of clearance outside the chassis and 70mm inside, which is 60mm with the drive cage in the rearmost position. Lee and Lee fail to note this on their manual manual, compatibility, slides, specs, all that sort of stuff, they only seem to mention 70 millimeters, and if you want it to be 70, you'd have to remove the drive cage. Anyway, up top can take a couple of 140 or 120 millimeter fans and matching 280 or 240 millimeter radiator. There's 57 millimeters of depth clearance to the edge of the motherboard, enough for at least a 30 millimeter radiator and a 25 millimeter fan. You could get more in, but it depends on the protruding features of your board. You'd have to measure that for yourself. It's the kind of feature few cases provide since it really bulks up the height aspect of the case. So there's definitely been some consideration for water coolers. The rear can take a 120mm fan, but no official support for a 120mm radiator. So if you're really pushing it, you'll need to make your own measurements with some detailed radiator diagrams or just have the radiator in hand to ensure what you're thinking of can fit. The basement shroud can take a couple of 120mm fans, and I touched on them earlier when I was discussing the filter. Lee and Lee don't include these positions in the manual since they're not intake fans for the case, just redirecting fans for the graphics card. But they do note them in the pictographs and provide long screws to fit them down to the basement shroud. I like the sentiment, but the execution is not flawless, let's say. So with the power supply unit installed below, the rear fan position is completely blocked off. Well, not completely, but it's so blocked up that there's only six millimeters of space between the fan and the power supply unit below, not even enough space to allow the HD audio connector to pass between the power supply unit and the basement shroud. The front fan position isn't blocked though, so there's hope there, but that's with a 140 millimeter deep power supply unit. So if you went for a big 180 millimeter power supply unit, then it would be covering nearly a third of its area too. You might be able to get a few degrees knocked off with this option and I'll explore it in testing later but before testing if it makes much more than three degrees difference on the GPU temperatures I'll be surprised. Also no official radiator support here but if you're plucky you might be able to make something work here and it might be the only worthwhile thing you can do with this option. Speaking of the power supply unit, the install was flawless, but I'm not really a big fan of the foam support strips. They do the job, but I'd much prefer to see a set of more durable grommet retained silicon feet. Whether that would be more expensive from a manufacturing and assembly point of view, I don't know, but I'd love to find out somehow. The motherboard installation was also very easy. The rear IO punched in place nicely and there's proper water cooling support up top, so there was plenty of room to connect the EPS or CPU power connectors post motherboard and CPU cooler installation. We've even got a standoff post and that's something I'm glad they didn't skimp on in the value engineering meetings.
Bringing up the second and last compatibility slide, the CPU cooler support is anything up to 166mm, which shoes up to the rather large 155mm side Mugen 5. Biggest air cooler on the market right now is the 172mm Maker 8 thing from Cooler Master, which I discussed in the top 10 most compatible ATX cases video, if you fancy checking out some crazy cases. But back to the 215, at 166 millimeters of support, you're not missing out on a lot of coolers, most sitting in around 160 millimeters. Drive compatibility is reasonable. We've got a drive cage that can be positioned forwards or backward and is slotted into the chassis with some screw fixed grommets, which makes removing and changing its position very simple. No need to tip the case over, nice and user friendly. Its position will have an impact on the power supply and its support and the radiator support up front, but we discussed that earlier. 230mm when it's back and 260mm when it's forward and 400mm of power supply unit clearance when it's completely removed. It can take a couple of 3.5 inch drives, which is decent but nothing special. However, it's done very efficiently by having the second drive fixed to the top of a small drive cage rather than being side fixed and requiring more materials and manufacturing, pro manufacturing processes. Of course, that means the savings are passed on to you in the form of needing to remove the drive cage and the lower drive to install the, and or remove the top drive. But since they've made it so easy to remove the drive cage, it doesn't bother me that much. No need for plastic drive sleds is all fine by me. There's also room for a two and a half inch drive on top of the cage if you wanted. And speaking of two and a half inch drives, we've also got a couple of sleds for those to the back of the motherboard tray. They don't use retained screws, which is great and they are held in place with some hooks in the tray. A little awkward to replace but it could be worse. Graphics card installation was very clean, the screws for the PCI Express slots are internal and there's a cutout in the chassis to accommodate your screwdriver. I still have no idea why they put thumb screws here, like, like seriously, it doesn't make any sense over a normal screw. They're heavier than a standard screw so they fall off your screwdriver that you will be using when your card is in position since you can't use your thumb and finger to both replace and see the thumb screw that you're screwing in. Sure, you can unscrew them with your fingers but then when there's no card, but that's not the tricky bit. Please, like the retained thumb screws for the panels, get rid of these thumb screws here. They're gonna make these retained as well, aren't they? Touching on cable management, there are plenty of features to help you out. The most obvious are the large grommets, which are good, but I'm not a fan of the Velcro straps being in line with the vertical ones. I was skeptical before the build, but during and after, I just don't get it. You end up with situations where you're squeezing larger cables like the motherboard 24 pin and the USB 3 cable past the IO cables from the top, and it's just applying more pressure than necessary. Will it damage the cables? It probably not, but it could cause you to pull the cable a little harder than you'd like and make you make a mistake, potentially. Velcro straps, yes, but like the road network, you don't put the slip road over the motorway. They should go side by side. Moving on, as mentioned earlier, the HD audio cable wasn't able to make it past the power supply unit, which meant I couldn't get it through the hole that it was meant for in the basement cover. I could have unscrewed the power supply in it, shuffled it around, but I just put it through the other hole. Make those cutouts a little deeper towards the motherboard tray and we're all good. Otherwise, there's plenty of cable management loops formed out of the motherboard tray. I had a little bit of a reach issue with the 24 pin cable and I had to remove it from the lower strap, but minus that and that's more of the power supply unit cable issue, not the case. Other than that though, it's perfectly reasonable and I think it does a reasonable job. They even managed to include a loop perfectly in place for me to add a velcro strap for all the fan cables. Let's touch on the RGB-ness of the fans. This case comes with an ARGB controller and a fan power unit. I say fan power unit because there's no speed control of this unit. It doesn't connect directly to the board, at least not for the fan control fan speed control. I can only assume that the fans run at full speed and that's not a bad assumption to make since the front 200mm fans are 800rpm units that ran at 680rpm for me, both actually ran at that speed, very consistent, and the rear is an 1100rpm fan that ran at 1000rpm for me so they're pretty slow as fans go and quite quiet fans regardless but we'll discuss that later in the testing later on. Actually the fans are on now at their slowest speed and uh, the fans in my lights are actually much louder, so 
it's very quiet fans. Anyway, back to the controller. The left bank is for fan connectors. They're all three pins in this case, but if you have other fans, you could plug them in here. The right is for ARGB connectors. Up top is a header for the top LED button, and, and to the right is for linking up to your motherboard for ARGB control, if you have a board that can control ARGB lighting. And finally, at the base of this little board is the power connector that links up with your power supply unit, SATA power connector, to fuel the fans and lighting. This all might be very slightly rearranged on your unit if you get one or have one. Just looking at the manual, the top section is very slightly different, but all functions the same. As for lighting effects and the lights themselves, you've got the usual setup, but I think there are a few key ones that are missing. And this is coming from someone who sticks to static colors for lighting or the ultimate static color off. They've got the usual rainbow transition color, which is nice and calm, nice and calm pace, you can see here. There are also a good set of statics, fades, and one color to the next kind of ones. But we're missing single color breathing or fading for all the colors. Instead, we've got a few jarring switching and looping ones. I'd like to see a little more control from manufacturers to tailor the preset lighting modes to suit the style of case they're creating, or at least select a handful of styles or modes to suit the style of the case best and add others for good measure. A lot of what's on offer seems a bit over the top and this doesn't seem like an over the top style case to me. Last things to add, if you're connecting it to your board, hold the LED button for three seconds to allow the board to control the lighting and if you want to turn them off, hold the button down for longer until they turn off. I get, well, you wouldn't imagine. It's amazing how many comments I get about controlling case lights, so I do need to cover the basics and, and make sure that they're thoroughly included in the video, I guess. Before we get into the performance, let's cover the parts box, or bag in this case, and the manual after. Parts bag first. Sure, it's a bag. Yes, it's also Lee and Lee, but it does the job well enough. And I'd rather have a bag that helps to reduce the cost of the case. Uh, you know, every little helps. You get all the usual screws, only this time they're unpainted to suit the white case, apart from some black screws. Um, we've also got some long screws for the basement shroud fan positions, and we've got a set of zip ties. Would have much preferred Velcro, but there we go. Onto the manual. It's not too bad. It's book-like in style and a little backwards, sure, but oh, dardo. Oh. It's masked to be like a book, but it's a broadsheet newspaper NZXT style manual. Okay, it's nowhere near as bad as the NZXT's nonsense. Check out their excuse for manuals in my reviews of the H210i and the H510 Flow. This one's actually well presented and the pictures and graphs are good enough, if a little dark. It's actually much better on the PDF version from Lee and Lee's website. For this case, the page numbers actually make sense there. All right, less of the snark, let's talk performance. Before the test results, acoustically limited and full speed, let's quickly cover the testing setups. The test system remains unchanged, of course, so we've got the usual 6700K cooled by the size Mugen 5 and the EVGA GTX 1070 for the win. Both have their fan speeds locked, 70% for the size Mugen 5 and 50% for the 1070 for noise output reasons. And only the speeds of the case fans will change since we're testing the case and not the capability of the internal hardware. The first test setup for the case is the stock setup. So we've got the 200 millimeter fans up front and the single 120 millimeter fan to the rear. The second setup is going to test what I was querying earlier, the basement shroud positions. So I had to think, and the most important piece of information I want to know is whether a fan above the power supply unit section is beneficial in any way. So I'm testing the stock setup with an additional fan to the rear of the basement shroud. This is one of my test fans, a Noctua NF F12 Chromax. Without a front basement fan, this should theoretically be the best case scenario for the rear position. It's not competing with another fan for intake air from the 200mm fans from the front, and the power supply unit is pretty short at 140mm, reducing its resistance over a standard 160 or 180mm unit. Anyway, that's what's being tested. How did it do? Starting with those two setups first, and then we'll compare to other cases in just a moment. With the fans at full speed, the setup with a basement shroud was performing worse. Throughout the two tests, adding up all the CPU and GPU temps, all in all, it's about eight degrees hotter. That's two degrees average 
per test. But going back to the breakdown, all the extra heat is in the graphics card, so there's something about that extra fan that's supposed to help the graphics card that's actually hurting it. I have a theory on that, and maybe you do too, but before we get onto that, let's finish off these results. Case fan speed and sound levels from the full speed testing is here. Not a huge change in speeds, but the 1200 RPM Noctua test fan certainly raised the average for the extra fan. The acoustically normalized testing where the case fan speed have been reduced to limit the noise output to 37.5 dBA at 40 centimeters from the front of the case. Again, the extra basement fan is causing problems. Now, since the noise output of these stock fans at full speed hit 38 dBA and the noise normalized target is 37.5 dBA, the fan speed didn't reduce a lot for the stock setup, but it did drop a fair amount for the extra basement shroud option with that extra fan. I could go into the minute details here between the full fan speed and acoustically normalized results, but the changes aren't vast since the fan speeds haven't changed a massive amount. But what remains consistent is the extra basement fan is significantly raising the temperature of the graphics card, especially when we'd expect it to noticeably reduce its temperature if anything. The reason I think this is happening is threefold. Firstly, I think very much like the entrance to a supermarket or shop, it's creating an air curtain like effect that's reducing the ability for the air to exhaust through the rear PCI Express slot covers, which incidentally are quite restrictive and could do with more free area. Secondly, I think the upstream of the air is potentially encouraging some of the hot air spewing out of the side of the card back into the card. Hot air could exhaust out the side towards the front of the case, getting pushed towards the rear from the airflow of the front 200mm fans, and back up into the card instead of out the back. And thirdly, I think all of that could be exacerbated by the resistance caused by the large power supply unit below. That could be vastly reducing the, air, the actual airflow of the basement fan, preventing it from potentially doing some good. Maybe if that power supply unit was smaller, it could push faster and provide a benefit. Now that all could be verified with more and different testing, perhaps an SFX power supply unit, an anemometer could help and all the rest. But frankly, for the purposes of understanding whether it helps or not with a very standard setup like we've got here, we've got all we need. It would be nice for manufacturers, not just Lee and Lee in this case, plenty of them do it, to make recommendations on setup based on their testing and also highlight what to avoid since I'm sure they'd love to save you some money on fans that they sell. Oh yeah. Okay, don't take that one seriously, that's just a conspiracy theory I've you know, thought in my head. My actual belief is they probably don't have the time and potentially resources and money to spend flapping around with this stuff. It can be irritating, tricky, and actually doing enough testing to isolate and verify a theory is, well, a theory, not just verify it, thoroughly verify it, is it's painstaking. They could even be creating themselves a noose to hang themselves with if customers don't understand the nuances of all this stuff. I mean, think of how many commenters will post on people's testing methodologies and stuff for just reviews, you know, and yeah, it, it, it's kind of tricky, tricky to wrap your head around uh, at the best of times. So anyway, bottom line is it would be good for them to at least show us a way that they found that their design decisions are beneficial, at least to prove it's worth thinking about. Anyway. That's enough of that, let's take the stock results forward and compare them to other cases and then get into the price, scoring and the final results. The full speed results places the Lancool 215 all in all as sitting just below the H510 Flow which was outstanding in performance and the open air test bench the Thermaltake Core P3. It's only about 4 degrees off the H510 Flow across the CPU and GPU temps in both tests so it's really not lagging far behind at all. Same goes for the acoustically limited testing, slightly hotter on the GPU side compared to the flow, but slightly cooler on the CPU side. Again, it's around four degrees behind the H510 flow, totaling the temperature of the CPU and GPU across both tests. So that's an average of one degree difference for each component, which is tight. Something else that's a little tight is my time making these videos. No, it's not a sponsor. 
Just a reminder to say if you like the video, please like the video uh, with the button and subscribe to support me doing more of this. The more support I can get, the more opportunities I can get, which will hopefully mean I can do more of this. If you're really keen, there's always the Patreon to support me directly. After each major video I do, like this review, I upload an exclusive video to Patreon covering all the updates since the previous one. So thank you for your time and let's move on to finalize the score. The specification scoring comes in at 24.5 out of technically 70. The specification score is essentially the average of the capacity of each component relative to the volume of the case and the rest of the market, or as much of the market as I've captured. Uh, that's about 300 cases or so far to this day. That's not to say it gets 3.5 out of 10 for spec scoring since I include fans into account for the specification score, and the Landcool 215 has some mighty big fans up front, and one to the rear. Nothing special, but pretty decent for a case fan, and those case fans are what save the 215 from misery. The size and amount of fans included, rated at good rather than basic or premium, that does factor into my calculations here, pump the specification score up to 9.4. I'm not 100% sure about the way I score fans. I do think fans are more of a bonus with a case, and if they're decent, they really don't need changing and can save you from spending $15 per fan or so on the individual fans you might want after. But maybe some tweaks are required to the way I score them. Build quality for the 215 sits at 8 out of 10. That score is being based on a table of preset criteria that all other cases are judged on, so it's not just based on how I happen to feel on the day of writing. It's really solid overall and it stood out thanks to the solid 3.5 inch drive cage, chassis flex and glass panel thickness. Top on the board, not a lot to complain about. Although I did spot some less than perfect paint prep, so yeah, not perfect, but overall pretty good. And rounding everything off, installation ease places the Landcool 215 really high up. It's the panels that brought it down quite a lot. Lacking grip for the glass side panel and retained thumb screws all over, which are a little awkward in my book. So all in all, the Landcool 215 sits really high on the scoreboard at a total of 9 out of 10. There's just not a lot to complain about. Objectively speaking, it's got good specs and solid fans, the performance is really solid, and on the subjective side, the installation process was mostly great, and while the build quality isn't amazing, it's still really good. Speaking of which, price-wise, this is the cheapest case I've reviewed in a while. Not that I've been reviewing Fractal Design Torrents lately, but at $70 MSRP, it cuts below the rest. So if we mash that together with the score being both the highest scoring case and the cheapest case means it wipes the floor with anything else on the board. Just to clarify that, this, this means it's the best price versus score case that I've reviewed in quite a while. Just to clarify, I don't think I made it quite clear enough. If you were thinking of picking this one up, please consider using the Amazon associate links in the video description. I earn through qualifying purchases made through those links and it doesn't cost you any any more, a penny more. I don't think I've missed anything glaringly obvious. If I have, I've really screwed up somewhere since this video is enormous now. Couldn't really help it, sometimes you just need to explain lots of things that takes a bit of time. Anyway, to support me making more of this stuff, please like the video and subscribe. The more of you that do that, the more I get to do of this, roughly speaking. There's always the Patreon to support me directly, thanks to the dedicated support from everyone on there, scrolling around now. And keep your eyes peeled for the update video in the coming days. And last but not least, thanks for checking this one out, and I'll catch you in the next one.